Cram.com. As a sleep specialist, I get a lot of heart doctors referring their atrial fibrillation patients to me to look for obstructive sleep apnea. Now, why are they doing that? And what is it that they expect me to do? Let's talk. Hi, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm a pulmonary and critical care sleep specialist and also the co-founder of MedCram.com, where we have continuing medical education videos and lectures for physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, medical students, and the lay public who are interested. Today, we're going to talk about the atrial fibrillation and obstructive sleep apnea connection and why are they connected. First of all, let's draw the heart and explain what atrial fibrillation is. This is the right side of the heart, and this is the left side of the heart. We have the right atrium up here where blood comes back from the body, and it's deoxygenated. So we'll color that blue. And then it goes down into the right ventricle here, still deoxygenated. Then it gets pumped out of this right ventricle, and it goes to two different sides of the lung, still deoxygenated. This is where it reaches the lungs, which we'll draw up here. Obviously, this is not anatomically correct. It's at this point that it becomes oxygenated and comes back to the right atrium through the pulmonic veins. And we'll color those bright red. And it comes back here, all nicely oxygenated, then goes down into the left ventricle after it goes through the left atrium, and it gets pumped out to the body through the aorta. So what atrial fibrillation is, is when the top part of the heart, which is the atria, is not contracting, but just simply wiggling around, if you will. The problem with that, of course, is that blood can coagulate there and get shot out as blood clots, either as a stroke, where a blood clot goes to the brain, or a blood clot goes to the lungs, and it lodges there. However, the other issue is, is that you're not getting a full contraction. And oftentimes, the thing that causes this atrial fibrillation is when these chambers, these very delicate chambers called the atria, get stretched out. So the question is, is why are they getting stretched out? Let's talk about that. So obstructive sleep apnea is a situation where when you go to sleep, your neck muscles go to sleep and the airway becomes obstructed. Right before it becomes obstructed, you might hear snoring, but then it completely obstructs. The person tries to breathe and there's no breath going in for 10 seconds. When that happens, there's no oxygen going down into the lung. Oxygen levels drop. Two things happen when that happens. First of all, you have the brain here. And the brain, of course, is always signaling and finding out what the oxygen levels are. When the brain finds out that the oxygen levels are going down, it sends nervous signals down to the heart, and it causes the heart to increase in heart rate and also in blood pressure. But something else that happens is important to understand as well, and that is that these arteries that are going towards the heart undergo something called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction when the oxygen levels are low. And so what you actually see here is that the pulmonary arterioles going to the lung become constricted, and as a result of that, there is a back pressure that is put on the right ventricle. So pressure here goes up because this becomes more narrowed. When the pressure in the right ventricle increases, the pressure in the right atrium also increases. And as a result of that, you start to get an increase in the size of the right atrium, which then leads to atrial fibrillation. Similarly, when the heart rate and the blood pressure are increased because the brain is not happy with that low oxygen, that also has a feedback here on the body, which causes the pressures to go up which causes left ventricular hypertrophy, which will lead to left atrial dilation, which leads to atrial fibrillation. In other words, when a cardiologist finds a patient in atrial fibrillation, what they're going to try to do is get the patient out of atrial fibrillation and back into normal sinus rhythm. They can do that through medications, they can do that through ablations if there's an issue that's causing it, or they could do it through cardioversion after a particular period of time. The real problem, though, is keeping that patient in sinus rhythm and preventing them from going into atrial fibrillation again. The problem is, is that if there continues to be low oxygen because of obstructive sleep apnea, 
this increased heart rate and blood pressure from increased sympathetic nervous system is going to always trigger these issues of atrial fibrillation. And so the cardiologist really wants to make sure that if there is any signs of obstructive sleep apnea that could be causing this low oxygen in the lung to get rid of it and make sure that it is treated. So again, low oxygen from obstructive sleep apnea causes sympathetic nervous system release from the central nervous system. It causes hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. This causes hypertrophy of both the right and the left ventricles, which then in turn cause enlargement of the right atria and left atria, so bilateral, the atria on both sides. When that happens, it gets stretched, and then stretching it causes atrial fibrillation. So if someone has atrial fibrillation, it's worth a check to make sure that they don't have obstructive sleep apnea, not only because it may have caused it, but if we want to get the patient out of atrial fibrillation back into normal sinus rhythm, it's going to be better if we identify obstructive sleep apnea and treat it. And we've talked about this before on our website, medcram.com, where we talk about the different treatments for obstructive sleep apnea and what they are. The one that has been the most studied is CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. What we're doing here is we are maintaining the airway open with gentle pressure to make sure that it does not close. So CPAP is certainly an option. Another option is a mandibular advancement device. That's where the lower jaw or the mandible is advanced so that the lower incisors are actually anterior to the upper incisors. What this does is it pulls the tongue forward and off the back of the throat where the area of obstruction is most likely to occur. Another option would be to do a hypoglossal nerve stimulator. And a hypoglossal nerve stimulator is the same idea. So the hypoglossal nerve is the 12th cranial nerve, which innervates the genioglossus muscle, which is the muscle that is responsible for protruding your tongue forward. And so if we stimulate that hypoglossal nerve, we're going to get, again, an anterior motion of the tongue when the person is breathing in and is asleep. And that's hopefully going to open up the airway and prevent this lack of oxygen here. And if you want to know more information about obstructive sleep apnea, visit us at medcram.com, where we have a course called Sleep Apnea Explained Clearly. It includes four continuing medical education credits, MOC points, and continuing education. You can see here we have a number of reviews with 4.9 out of 5 stars. Atrial fibrillation is a very common diagnosis, and you really want to do everything that you possibly can to, number one, avoid it if you can. Number two, if you do get it and it goes back and forth, that's called paroxysmal, then to try to keep it in sinus rhythm. And the way to do that is to reduce sympathetic nervous system discharge by treating any obstructive sleep apnea that might be present. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, turn on notifications, give us a comment below about what you think and join us at medcram.com.